Hey, well, uh, welcome everybody to lecture three. Um, today we're going to be looking at historical models of mission. Um, and then next week we'll be looking at contemporary models of mission. Uh, and so let me first just preface this by saying I'm going to try to do an impossible task here, which is uh, summarize 2000 years of um, church uh, missional history and this uh, very short lecture. So that's not going to happen. So what it's going to be is kind of a, a snapshot, really, of a couple different models <clears throat> that we're going to look at that will hopefully inform uh, the practice of mission and evangelism in our context today. Uh, and we'll learn from these models. And at some point, um, as we look at all the different historical and contemporary models of mission, uh, we'll get to a place where we can start to identify um, what models are at work in fresh expressions of church, uh, what kind of uh, missional approach are we having in, in our local congregations. Um, and so last week, we kind of explored this biblical foundation for the concept of mission itself, or the missio dei. And remember, that's kind of uh, viewing mission itself as an attribute of God, that God is a missional God, the church is a missional instrument, that we are a people on, on mission. Um, and we looked at that word apostello, or sentness, or mission, and we tried to uh, establish kind of a biblical foundation for all of that. Today, I want to kind of go a little bit further and to say, uh, I love this, uh, Martin Collar was the first to say this, that mission is the mother of theology, right? Mission is the mother of theology. And as we read the book of Acts and, and the Gospels, we can kind of see that, right? That um, as, as the disciples, the apostles are engaged in the practice of mission, um, they're formulating their theology and they're also uh, establishing kind of an ecclesiology, if you will, or, or the structures of mission, uh, which is the purpose of the structures of the church from the beginning and should be to this day, is to facilitate the flow of God's love into the world or, or the mission of God in the world. And so I typically um, operate from the perspective of, myth, of a missiologist that when I'm thinking theologically, um, I'm seeing mission as kind of the source of our theological reflections, and th they should be practical, right? They should have implications uh, for how we live out God's mission in the world. And so just to kind of give us a, a little brief uh, definition, mission is concerned with the movement of Christianity from one culture to the next, or this is kind of the, the, the premise that we're working with here in this class, that mission is concerned with how Christianity moves from one context or one culture to the next. And a key question to kind of keep before you uh, as, uh, as we study this is what are the significant missiological constructs or um, the interpretive models within various historical exchanges? So what kind of models are people using as they spread the faith, as they uh, transfer Christianity from culture to culture? What are the assumptions of, of the missionaries? What are their theological uh, frames that are kind of undergirding their, their, their uh, mission and their approach? Um, and these interpretive models, they're, they're just these kind of constructs or frameworks that they shaped the intercultural interactions between missionaries and contexts. And we'll get into later uh, the idea of culture and, and um, what that interaction looks like, and we'll look at some ways to think about that. But here for today, um, what, what are we, these constructs, what are these models that missionaries used either intuitively or uh, quite deliberately in spreading the faith in those different contexts? So we'll start at the beginning. Um, up until Constantine, Christianity was more of a movement. It was, it was fluid. It was about multiplication and expansion, very, very loose kind of structures, um, not a clear hierarchy. Uh, Christians didn't own buildings. They were subversively kind of meeting anywhere they could, you know, scratching the ichthus, the, the fish symbol in, in the wall of caves or wherever they can meet in people's houses. Uh, and so we'll revisit that very primitive and early 
um, uh, model like what we saw last week in the book of Acts and um, uh, how mission was kind of flowing and underground and networked, if you will. Things really change um, in 13, uh, 313 AD when Emperor Constantine makes uh, Christianity the state religion. Somewhere in the 300s AD there, uh, Constantine makes uh, Christianity the state religion. And the church and the empire are kind of one. So imperial expansion and expansion of the faith are intertwined. And imperial methods are employed, right? Um, so we go from like no Christians being able to be in military service to now all military service uh, having to be Christian, right? Uh, and so at sometimes in this model, um, there is actually violence uh, to spread the faith and we get crusades and all of that business. The key kind of fundamental premise of this model is the church is kind of this building or this place where we invite people to come to. And so Constantine and, and the church launch these massive building projects. And so we go from meeting in caves and homes and kind of this missional network to now we're this kind of more centered uh, uh, in a building kind of thing. Now, I do want to say that these are these are vast sweeping generalizations, okay? And to each one of these models, there are outliers all along. And so these are general models and trends. Uh, they're not a summarization of the, of the approach all throughout history, right? There's always going to be outliers, and I'll try to note a couple of those. But primarily, the Constantinian model had imperial power, uh, expansion of, of the empire was connected to the faith. Um, and there's some, there's some assumptions that are going on in that, right? So if we look at Proverbs, by me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By, my rule, by me, rulers rule and nobles, all who govern rightly. Anybody in that Constantinian model would say, yes, you know, God established the king uh, and the church and the state are kind of this one thing. Um, another way to think about this is Paul, who, by the way, it's interesting that he gives us this wisdom in Romans 13, where he himself was actually executed for political subversion and for not being subject to the governed authorities, because at some point, uh, governing authorities uh, under Nero and different Caesars began to demand worship, and Christians refused to do that, and they were executed before they would uh, give their allegiance to a Caesar or the empire. Uh, but generally speaking, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. There's no authority except from God, and the authorities exist that have been instituted by God. And so people in the Constantinian model would say, you know, they'd be in the amen choir uh, to this uh, text, right? So the Constantinian model, which took on many different forms, and a, 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 an expression of it exists today, right? Particularly in Euro-tribal expressions of the church, uh, where there's some pieces of this that still exist today uh, and creates this thing that we call Christendom, right? That um, the, the, the Christian kind of empire um, flows back to this idea of, you know, uh, the Constantinian model. But it's based on this idea that monarchy and the divine right of kings is somehow connected and authorized by the church and imperial, uh, imperial expansion was normative in this model. Um, now, that is a, just a big chunk of history we could go through. We could look at different outliers, and we will look at some of those. Um, we're going to look at these, you know, wandering um, celibate monks uh, that all through the Constantinian mo model, they were trying a different model. They were living with the people, dwelling with the people, taking on the cultures and the customs of the people. The Constantinian model was more, we bring the culture uh, in this culture we kind of enforce on everybody else. Um, but remember that there are outliers all through this and um, the Franciscans and, and uh, uh, St. Ignatius and, and uh, different people throughout history, uh, the Jesuits that we'll look at, and you'll see that up close and personal when you watch the movie, The Mission. So don't, don't forget to watch that movie and you'll be reflecting on that. But I wanna jump into these five models quickly uh, just kind of look at these um, that have kind of dominated the past five centuries. Then next week, we'll look at some more modern, um, ne next lecture, we'll look at some more modern iterations of this. So the replacement model, the indifference 
model, the ennoblement, uh, the indigenization model, and the appropriation model. We'll go through these very quickly. So the replacement model is simply um, a method that attempted to wipe the slate clean. So we're going to replace the culture, whatever's there, with Christian culture, per se, right? So we're going to come in, wipe out whatever's there, uh, and, 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 uh, and plant our version of Christian culture, right? Um, here's some biblical uh, validation. Uh, people using this model would point to Deuteronomy 7.5 and say, this is what you're to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols with fire, right? And um, people in the replacement model would be in the Amen choir on that passage. But the assumption of this model is a tabula rasa, blank slate, where we just need to clean the slate. Um, the, the, the old religions, the old cultures, they're demonic. The, the people that live in these places are primitive. And, and we just come in you know, with military power uh, and, and we abruptly replace whatever's there with Christianity. Um, now we're gonna look at good and bad of all these models. And, and uh, I don't, my personally, personal opinion here, don't find a whole lot good about this model, but uh, an example of what we can see here is in the new world in Latin America. This model was um, in, employed from 1493 and into the 1800s. But the uh, in Indian religions, they're seen as animalistic, demonic, and idolatrous. Christian Spaniards uh, viewed themselves as commissioned by God to propagate the faith as divine providence. So, you know, traveling priests alongside uh, conquistadors um, and, and, you know, Christianity was, was an imperial strategy, like subjugate the people, um, teach them the faith. It'll make them kind of docile and they'll live under, uh, you know, uh, rule, the rule of the empire. Um, so that's one model. The, the indifference model um, is there's an indifference to the existing culture, to, to say it simply. The goal is the conversion of individuals one by one with little consideration to their cultural identity. So we're indifferent to the existing culture. That's not really on our radar doesn't matter. You know, we're going in and we're trying to convert individuals. We're not giving a whole lot of thought um, to what culture and context exists there already. And so this is a missionary method that's employed um, uh, where we use the, ima the imatio Christi, the imitation of Christ. Um, so we're imitating Jesus, particularly his vulnerability and his lowliness within the culture. So we're becoming a, a incarnational presence uh, within the culture uh, without really thinking much of the culture itself. Obviously a text that uh, uh, is an undergirding text for this model, Philippians 2, that great poem that um, probably predates Paul that was placed in a letter to the Philippians of this self-emptying of Jesus, moving into our neighborhood, emptying himself, uh, taking on a posture of vulnerability, in our context, our dress, our language, uh, the word of God has moved into the neighborhood and dwelled among us, right? So there's this emptying, this movement, this downward trajectory kind of idea. Quite different than the uh, replacement model, right? And we'll see the different uh, approaches as we go through this. But in this model, Jesus is the proto-missionary, right? So in Jesus, the text we looked at, in our last lecture, you know, the, just as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Jesus is sent to the world as a missionary, right? And his, his life, his incarnation and his death and resurrection is kind of the model for this mission. Um, the, the key assumption here is the Holy Spirit precedes the missionary. Um, so it's not that the cultures where we go are, are bankrupt and demonic and just need to be wiped out. Um, there's some of that, obviously, but th those in the indifference model, that's not really on their radar. Um, they're, they're trying to join into what the Holy Spirit's doing in a context already. Does view people with sacred worth, right? And that every person that uh, wherever we go uh, is of sacred worth and great value. And the focus here is really kind of creating the ecclesiola and ecclesia, the, the little church within the greater church. So it wasn't necessarily a strategy to like spread the institutional church all over the world. Wasn't too concerned with that. It was concerned with making little Christian communities 
small groups um, within the larger church, a community of believers, right? Um, an example of this is uh, Zinzendorf of the Moravians of von Hernhut uh, from 1727 to, into the 1900s. But so, and, and this, this is somebody who lived out the indifference model uh, and where we kind of draw this model from really. But the missionary plays a limited role in God's comprehensive plan of salvation. So we're not coming in tabula rasa, wiping things out, you know, the missionary plays a limited role um, uh, in, in converting individuals one by one. And the greater work of the kingdom, you know, in, in that is of God. So it's primarily lay led. It's bivocational uh, missionaries, uh, mostly, um, and typically not ordained uh, priests. We don't do away with the existing religion or culture. We learn to live within it, but still embodying our distinct culture. Um, so the Moravians very much embodied their own um, European culture, uh, but weren't really concerned with that greater culture. Um, so indigenous people are human beings in whom the spirit is already at work. This is an assumption of the Moravians. And there's great value placed on listening, pneumat pneumatological delimitation. So we're, we're going into the context, we're listening to the people. We're listening to what God is up to. We're, we're, the assumption is God's already here, and we're kind of joining into that with these people, and so we're listening. Uh, and this is not about expanding Christian Euro European culture. That's not the goal of it. Um, now, inadvertently, they kind of were because they were holding fast to that culture themselves uh, wherever they went, and they had very clear liturgies and clear ways that they did church. Um, but one of the really beautiful things about um, the Moravians and Zizendorf and um, uh, their, their kind of uh, missiological legacy is they worked with African slaves and Indians, and they were foundational in the anti-slavery movement. So they would actually go in um, and, and live with and uh, interpret the languages and dwell along with um, because of their, their, their theology that people are of great worth and sacred value. And they actually did some foundational things around the anti-slavery movement. Um, so there was no systematic theology per se. Uh, it was rather a conversational theology, deeply pietistic uh, uh, spiritual practice, a big part of this. And by 1899, the, the, the Moravians kind of realized that through, through uh, Christianizing, through converting individuals, they were actually whole people groups. Uh, were being Christianized, and so they kind of changed their tune around the importance of the individuals, because what happened was when these converted indigenous leaders in these contexts uh, became leaders in their own right, in, the, in their own formation, uh, the entire people groups uh, in, ended up being converted, um, even though their strategy was one by one and kind of indifference towards the culture. By the way, for those of you there, uh, Wesleyan and in the, the kind of Methodist, pan-Methodist world, John Wesley was deeply influenced by their Moravians, uh, Zinzendorf, and their, their model. So just a little uh, fun fact. The ennoblement model, this is our third model we're looking at here. Uh, and this is about the ennoblement of the existing culture. Um, so it's very attuned to culture. It's not at all indifferent to culture. The goal is actually elevating the recipient culture. And one of the assumptions here, it, it's, it assumes an evolutionary model of human civilization. So kind of this progress narrative and that human civilization is evolving to this greater state, right? This greater good are some of the underlying assumptions here in the ennoblement model. And it's a missionary method that literally sought to Christianize all of humanity. That was the goal. So in, in contrast to um, the Moravians and their one by one and kind of indifference to the culture, uh, in the ennoblement model, the idea was when entire people groups become Christian, it would lead to the comprehensive development of humanity as a whole. Humanity will get better the more Christians there are, and it'll lift up you know, civilization. And so mission and culture are considered equally uh, important uh, in, in the peer view of the missionary. A text to think about this, you know, Isaiah 63 would really resonate with the ennoblement folks that nation shall come to your light and kings uh, 
to the brightness of your dawn. Obviously, this is a prophecy about Israel, but uh, um, that there was language of the new Jerusalem and the new Israel and that, that kind of the West or North America and European really uh, culture saw themselves as this light and they were going to lift up um, all of the world. Now, there's some problems with this model. Some of you are already probably picking up on this, right? But it's uh, interpreted as the white man's burden, it's been called. Um, and so European civilization was tasked with ele elevating other cultures to its own superior state of development. Now, can you think of some issues with that uh, mentality, right? So there's this, like this hubris, this superiority that's implicit in this, right? that all the other cultures of the world are like, they're in different degrees of uh, enlightenment. And so we're gonna go, you know, as the superior culture and, uh, and, and, and lift them and noble them, all right? So non-Christians are seen as belonging to foreign people groups. The mass of people are civilized to a greater or lesser extent. So some civilizations they would view as you know, higher um, uh, uh, degrees of civilization and then lesser. And the job of the missionary is to ennoble and lift up uh, the culture. And these cultures advanced through the means of education. So what was their main approach with this? How did they do this? Uh, well, to lift them up to reach the pinnacle of uh, Euro-Christian, Euro-tribal culture, uh, education was a, was a key part of this. So um, we could look at an example of this as the General Evangelical Protestant Mission Association. Pretty long name, right? Um, and the missionary works with the country's um, uh, intelligence agencies, different people in leadership, different governmental authorities to increase literary, educational, and spiritual growth. So in the ennoblement model, creation of institutions and hospitals, uh, kindergartens and nursing homes, um, so there was this first like lift up, educate, teach people uh, to read and to write and all of that. And then comes the next level of this would be approach would be kind of the practical social work aspects of it. Um, and so missionaries are just as involved with, you know, preaching and teaching as they are creating kind of these institutions, if you will, uh, and building schools and all of that. So the progressive development of the world is facilitated through Christianity and the kingdom of God in the earth. There's almost this idea like we can bring the kingdom, which by the way is a heresy. Nobody can bring the kingdom but Jesus, but we can become the ingredients of the kingdom, but we can't make the kingdom of God come on earth. Only, only our Lord can do that. But there was this kind of idea that we could, if we made the enough nations and enough peoples Christian, we would bring the kingdom of God. So culture has this elitist undertone with European, North America, you know, obviously is the superior ones um, and missionaries were academically educated um, and many proponents were blind to these presuppositions. Like they just assumed we're the enlightened ones, we're the West, you know, we, we are going to go and lift up all these other cultures. So you can see some obvious problems with that, right? The next model, the fourth model we're going to look at uh, is the indigenization model. And the, uh, an assumption here is the gospel becomes indigenous to an ethnic group. And the goal is the Christianization of entire nations and the establishment of a contextually appropriate church. Um, so um, indigenizing uh, a, a movement of the people where the people kind of own uh, the gospel and the church uh, raises up in native soils, right? So uh, if you think of somebody like the Catholic priest Vincent Donovan, who worked with the Maasai people, who said, my job with the Maasai was to uh, plant the seeds of the gospel and let it grow wild and to learn from them and who was God to them and what that meant and work from that framework. So it's a missionary method that assumes all culture is of divine origin. Uh, and the, the missionaries to be a learner and a translator. So we're getting a little better than the uh, ennoblement um, method, right? Where we're, you know, we're the superior culture. We're going to go, you know, Christianize and make uh, other people enlightened, right? But it, it assumes the restoration of divine orders of creation. So this looks actually back to the past, to like the pre-fall situation 
um, and and that through it de- in every culture uh, that all cultures were created by God, that all all human beings are made in the image of God, and so through mission um, and through indigenization is actually the restoration from that pre-fall state. So each culture in its own way is an expression of the beautiful diversity of God, right? So there's some really cool things about this model. There's also some some bad things. We'll get to that. But um, and you would say, you know, Genesis 127, God created humankind in his image and the image of God. He created them male and female. God created them. Right. Uh, And so that these these missionaries uh, in the indigenization was they. God's already there, that every culture represents God, that every culture is an expression of God. Uh, the imago dei, the image of God, is kind of a key fundamental theological premise here. Um, so the missionary studies the language in the meaning systems of the host culture. So they're doing semiotics, reading the signs and meaning systems and symbols of that culture, learning it. An integral part of mission work is to understand the type of communality of a people. Um, So how do these people live in community? How is that expressed? And then how do we as the missionary work in that form of community? Um, And the Christian faith should emerge in an appropriate indigenous communal way. Um, So let me go with an example so we can kind of unpack this a little bit. Um, But Bruno Gutmann um, of the Leipzig Mission Society uh, is our kind of our case study of this. Um, and he he came with a critical view of civilization. So almost the opposite of the noblemen assumptions, right? That uh, Western um, and European and North American were the dominant, you know, that everybody else needed to, to lift and be ennobled to that place, right? Uh, he saw industrialization, urbanization led to individualization and inequality and poverty, right? That, that individualization was not a natural, actually human state of being. And so he, he grew up in a, um, a context where he could see that um, face to face. Human beings are created communal. So we're, we exist in a web of relationships, like in the Afrocentric uh, framework of Ubuntu. Uh, we are persons through other persons. So collectivistic, um, whereas the West um, is is very individualistic, right? Um, and so he was trying to validate and, and, and to say that this individualization of everything is unnatural. It's, it's not God's natural state of things. And remember, so we're trying to get back to that pre-fall relational communal um, space, right, in this model. So European culture was actually corrosive to other cultures. It was not uh, lifting them up. It was actually poisoning them. And Jesus existed in and redeemed uh, what uh, Gutmann called primordial ties. So individualistic Christianity and individual con- conversion was inappropriate. When you extract a person out of their social web, out of their network of relationships, you are actually damaging uh, community. You are actually damaging the fabric of community. And um, for this model, community is actually the goal of civilization. So they would push back against the Moravians, uh, right, and say, no, you can't be indifferent to culture because cultural is God-given and it's something that should be celebrated and lifted up, right? Um, and so to be created in the image of God means to live in a mutual responsibility and the emphasis is on these primordial ties that predate the fall to sin. So um, Gudman saw this uh, expression of uh, culture as something that was uh, deep, you know, pre-fall communal thing that needed to be actually lifted up and the gospel interacted and, and found an indigenous expression in the midst of that. And Jesus himself is the prototype of communality, right? So he embodied this for us. Jesus was in a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? The Trinity. Jesus created communities uh, of disciples, right? And they lived in community together. Uh, Tribal traditions are superior to those imported by European civilization. So in this model, it's not bringing the the import, the Euro tribal Christianity. Uh, It's actually the the civilizations where we are, the cultures where we are, are superior uh, to that European culture. Um, And so the the cultural and religious elements of tribal configurations are 
indispensable medium through which the kingdom of God is established among humanity. So for a church to be a faithful expression of the gospel, it needed to be an expression of the culture uh, that was there, right? And so only those customs that directly conflict with the gospel are to be abolished. Now, this is where things get a little bit hairy in this model. And we'll look at this, but when there are things that are directly um, what the missionary would consider to be out of line with scripture. So like, uh, we're, you know, uh, uh, sacrificing human beings, for instance, or um, the, the subjugation of women, or you could kind of do a laundry list of this, of uh, people in a caste system that were oppressed and um, denied community, the untouchables, or um, those would be things that would be in conflict and need to be abolished. So the individual should not be extracted from those social relationships where, where the, the gospel takes root in the community. Um, so some of the, the negatives that we, you probably have started to see in this model, it, it's undergirded by this paternalism. Like who makes these decisions? Who's going to decide um, uh, that, you know, uh, what, what's good and what's bad and what, what's not, you know? Well, the missionary actually. And, and so they're operating from this, you know, father knows best kind of role. Uh, and the heroic missionary comes from the outside to influence the cultural processes, to show the culture how beautiful and diverse they are and all of that. But what if cultures are deeply sick, right? What if there's a caste system culture uh, and untouchables and who makes the determination what healthy community looks like, what uh, exclusive community looks like in those things? Well, the missionary does in this model, right? And so the concept of people groups and culture is vulnerable to ideological exploitation. And, and we, saw, we saw that across history with this model. All the beautiful good things about this model, there's also some, um, uh, some negatives there as well. The final model we're gonna look at today uh, is kind of an emerging, more recent model actually that we're uh, becoming aware of. It's something that's existed all through Christian history. And there's a diversity of Christianities rather than uh, one Christianity. But um, this model reverses the assumption that the missionary is the actor, right? Rather, the recipient culture is the actor, right? So in all of these models we've looked at, uh, it's the missionary coming in and acting on the system, studying the system, incarnating in it, whatever. But the goal is for the host to actively appropriate the gospel for themselves in their own faithful way. Um, so the missionary method assumes the indigenous non-Christian cultures appropriate and form contextually appropriate expressions of Christianity for themselves, right? Um, so a, a passage here that we could look at got kind of um, to validate this is when Jesus and his disciples you know, they see this outsider and he's casting out demons. And we tried to stop him, Lord, he was doing this in your name and he's not one of us. He's not following you. Who's this guy? I think he is casting out demons in your name. But Jesus said, do not stop him for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. Whoever's not against us is for us, right? Um, and so you can see that there could be a diversity even in Jesus's own life and ministry of people claiming the name of Jesus and doing the things that Jesus was doing. Um, so in this model, culture is the permanent and foundational datum, uh, meaning culture is the consistent thing. Culture, again, coming back to kind of the indigenization assumptions, that culture comes from God, that human beings made in the image of God, um, that, that reflect the diversity of God, and those cultures reflect that, and, and culture is kind of the stable uh, thing. And cultures contacted by the gospel are always impacted positively. So again, now who's defining the gospel and what it is and, and what it isn't? And well, th there's a whole thing that we have to unpack there. But God is the primary actor in this model, um, that, that somehow God actually intervenes supernaturally. It's not always a missionary who cultivates new expressions of the church. Can you believe that? But God can do that all by God's self through people, right? So God created both culture and gospel in this model. So it's not that God didn't create culture and now it has to, the gospel, that, that in this model, they're kind of, um, that God has created both those things. And enculturation, this is a Catholic term that's very important. 
um, that started to come with, you know, Vatican II and, and the idea that the uh, church can actually, while it has some universal things that need to be consistent, that it can actually take on the, the culture, the expression, the context of where it's cultivated. So, um, and usually in this way, a charismatic leader has a direct encounter with God. Uh, there's a supernatural uh, occurrences are normative. There's signs and wonders and all of those things that we read about in scripture. Uh, direct communication through visions and dreams is a normal occurrence in this. Transcendent powers are passed on through ritual innovations that are usually culturally, contextually specific. So to give you an example of this, and we're, we'll wrap up uh, the lecture here, but well, some, some problems with this. Who's the recipient? Who's the sender in this model? Is there a pure, unadulterated gospel? Uh, Leslie Newbegin doesn't think so. Um, how is it transmitted? What's happening here? Uh, you know, some very weird cultic, uh, cult-like things have happened throughout history when someone has these direct contacts with God and they start, you know, something. And uh, we've seen historically uh, some, some, um, some manifestations of that, right? What makes the emerging community Christian in the historic sense? Some people would say some of the examples of this are not even Christian. So let's look at one of these examples, and this is Isaiah Shimbi, um, who actually planted the Nazareth Baptist Church, or it's also called the Shimbi Church by some. But Prophet Isaiah had, uh, he's also known as the umbrella tree from Zulu land and many other uh, terms that are attributed to him. Uh, but he began to experience dreams and visions and the gift of healing from a young age. Um, and growing up, he had... Uh, interaction with church. In fact, he was uh, a Wesleyan and even had a leadership role in the Baptist church. So he had some exposure to Christianity. But things changed uh, for Shembe when he was hit by lightning in a storm. And he was commissioned by God to travel east and um, in southern Africa. Uh, and so he did that. Uh, he left his wives and took up uh, the life of an itinerant missionary, healing the sick, driving out demons, going kind of place to place and doing that. Uh, he had a, a, a significant um, baptism and ordination and that he was given his name, Isaiah. Um, and after a time of temptation in the wilderness, if you read kind of the details of uh, his life and narrative, it looks um, very much like a recapitulation of uh, Jesus or one of the great prophets. And he constructed a church in uh, the Durban area, uh, and Shimbi's church developed with no influence or support from mission churches. So this is a key thing. It wasn't a missionary who came and, you know, uh, led Isaiah to Christ. And then he like went off and created this contextual church. It was outside of any influence from the mission station churches um, that Isaiah developed this church. Uh, and he, he incorporated many of the traditional elements of Zulu religion. So we would see some of that indigenization idea in this model as well. And he believes the same God that spoke to him uh, and, and called him to be a follower of Jesus, and he has, you know, supernatural encounters and words from Jesus, um, is the God of the Zulu. They're not different gods, right? And so he's um, kind of weaved in the, 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 the Zulu traditions and um, into this, into his church. Um, and so he's an example in, in this church of intuitive enculturation. So somebody outside the bounds of our traditional, like you send a missionary, they plan a thing, they go and Christianize it. His was outside of that whole world, right? Appropriation. Um, and the Shimbe Church, by the way, is one of the largest independent churches in South Africa. There are 4 million members, right? Not bad church plant. <laughs> For, uh, for Shimbe, and this is one of thousands of examples of these AFIs or these African independent churches in Africa, uh, and and many, and there's many more that have this kind of story where some kind of supernatural God encounter, Paul the Apostle on the road to Damascus taking many forms, where there's a call and then the, uh, the, the um, you know, appropriation of the Christian faith in a contextually appropriate way, and then the cultivating a, a contextually appropriate church. Right. So this is a whole other model that we're just beginning to kind of explore. And we'll come back to look at some of these more in depth later. But a key question to kind of leave you with um, as you study here, how do these missiological constructs 
these interpretive models, okay, inform the practice of evangelism and mission in your context today? As you are thinking through and, and looking at those models, and as you continue to, and we'll look at the contemporary models in the next lecture, um, where did you see, what kind of church um, were you raised in, or did you come to faith in, or, or were you converted in, and what do you think is the approach of, of primarily of your church, and could you see good and bad uh, in, in those models, um, and could you see, uh, um, you know, where maybe some of those practices uh, have informed the, the faith, the, the denominational expression, or the non-denominational expression, where you are in ministry today? Um, those things could actually help us think about um, the, the mission of God flourishing in the world. So thank you, everyone, for being part of uh, Lecture 3. Keep those readings going, and I'm excited to be on this learning journey with you, and I'll see you next time.